The great and amazing John Graham has won the USA Memory Championship for the third time. And that's really exciting because I like to jump on any opportunity to help people see how well memory techniques work, especially under duress, because John has a very interesting training regime that he puts himself under in order to consistently come up with increasingly impressive results. Not only that, but he's just fun to talk to, and you'll be pleasantly surprised by one simple detail about the memory techniques themselves that we go through in this episode of the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. But you know what? John and I wanted to go further than the usual shop talk about memory palaces and memory techniques. You see, like myself and many others, memory training has led to a lot more outcomes than flawless recall. And a few months ago, I got an interesting email from John about some of these additional outcomes. And they can be really hard to describe. They also risk leading into territory that's a little more than controversial. It's a lot controversial. And, you know, John asked me, sort of out of the blue, maybe sort of, Anthony, have you ever had an awakening? Now, I personally don't really believe in the theory of synchronicity, but the weird thing about his message is that I came to this office where I'm sitting now and I checked my email immediately after watching a documentary on cult leaders. And I was just going to make a couple of notes because as part of my research for the follow-up book on the victorious mind, which is called The Infinite Memory Palace Technique of Giordano Bruno, I've been studying things like cults and psychic phenomenon and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, Bruno, he wasn't himself a cult leader, but something like a cult-like following has grown up around him. And there are many movements that have, you know, led to all kinds of misperceptions about how he may have had all kinds of strange ideas that I'm not sure are mathematically reflected in his ideas about math and astronomy. And his use of the word magic really just means anything that transforms. And he was a proto-scientist to be sure, not a full-on scientist, but he was really part of that movement to find contemporary science. In any case, if you follow the Bruno stuff, someone the other day on Facebook posted a correction to a misquote about Bruno, trying to turn him into a mystic instead of the stronger philosopher and memory expert that I see in the historical record that I see in his own writings. Anyhow, I was doing all this research and then I was going into how am I going to avoid dipping my toes even further than I already have in the victorious mind without creating the wrong impression. Because a lot of people have emailed me and said, oh, can I come live with you? Can you be my guru? Etc. Etc. And, you know, I go out of my way to run a lot of experiments with memory techniques to lead to things like awakenings to experience things like what people talk about in terms of enlightenment. But I don't want false impressions growing up around them. And if you've seen my TEDx talk, you know that, you know, I'm not always successful in talking about it in the right way. One scripting error, and suddenly people have thought that I'm no longer my usual skeptical and atheistic self. And, you know, I can only look in the mirror because I could have written it a little bit better. In any case, Coincidence or synchronicity, I'm doing all this research, trying to figure out how to show what I really think in Bruno is a dissolution of the self and none of this mystical stuff that people think that he has going on in his text. And that's when John sends me this email. I read the email and he asked me, Anthony, have you had an awakening? And of course I have, I would call it that. But I hopped on a call with John about it. We traded our experiments and our thoughts about some of the weird and wonderful mental and even you could call them spiritual experiences that we both think memory training has been directly involved in producing and no doubt about it because there is such a thing as neuroplasticity, neurogenesis and neurogenesis, the actual feeling that you can have when new neuronal connections are forming in your brain this is just well evidenced, and it is something that I, I think anybody could feel, and that's why I'm very interested in going into these topics, but also being very, very careful about them. Anyway, so John and I decided to record a conversation about these topics, and we diverge on a few points, because there are areas that I don't want to go, I don't think that I can validate them. 
but we also converge on the aspects that matter the most when it comes to things that you can experience as a result of extended periods of focus, concentration, and the kinds of focus and concentration that come from training with additional constraints and distractions the way John Graham does. So let's get into it, shan't we? And let us know what you think. Are we losing our minds or swimming perfectly in the same great streams as the memory masters of the past who are bound to be misunderstood when they're trying to use and describe experiences beyond name and form? John, thanks for joining me again on the Magnetic Memory Method podcast. And congrats on winning the USA Memory Champion again, because or becoming the th three times now, I believe. And every time you do that, I have to like update everything and, and remember, you know, more details about you. So thank you for additional work in addition to <laughs> additional memory exercise, I should say, in addition to your win again, what goes through your mind in the minutes after you win, the days after you win, the weeks and the months, you know, how does it change uh, when you have that accolade? Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I wish I could be upstairs right now um, showing the three trophies off. That uh, The hardest part of winning is updating your website and all the things to <laughs> say number three. But, yeah. you know, the minutes after, and I'll be completely honest, um, the minute after you win, the moment you win, the moment I win, it feels normal. And I don't say that in a cocky way. I say that because I, I emotionalize, I live those moments hundreds of times before I actually go on stage and compete. And I think that's a secret of life for many people, like just to visualize and live in your dream, not just see it on a vision board, but feel it every mm -hmm. night if you're going to bed. That's what I do. And so when I win it, I get, I'm emotional in the moment, but I've relive, I've lived that emotion many times before. Um, and it's still a wonderful feeling. It doesn't take away from that, but I think it helps create that. Um, the weeks after the victory fades very quickly. Like that night I'm going to bed and it's like the day's done. I, I won it. And it kind of like, there's an emptiness to it. It's kind of like, we are always chasing the next thing in life. You know, you wake up, I got to have coffee because that'll make me happy. You have your coffee. I got a journal that'll make me happy. Then after you journal, I got to send this email. And then like everything is like the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. And winning a championship is no different. It might last a little longer, might feel a little bit better, but it's like, okay, now what? The next thing. And so, so it's the next thing for me. It's number four, maybe I'll, I'll visualize, I'll train for that. Um, but it's back to the girls, back to the work, back to learning and growing myself. If yeah. I'm being truthful, that's not the answer everyone expects to hear, but that's the truth of it. Oh, no, that's a great truth. Speaking of, you know, maybe next time, I think I saw Nelson. And for people who don't know Nelson Dallas, he's got more wins under his belt than you so far, not for lack of, uh, or, you know, you, you haven't even gone enough, I think, to have accumulated those wins if I'm doing my memory correctly here, but correct me if that's wrong, but nonetheless, he was saying something like that he he's tempted now to go next year. Does that, yeah. like, how does that factor into your visualization? Do you have to, you know, deal with nerves or fear about that? Or does it spurn you on to work harder or what does it do to you? If, 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 uh, if another champion says, Oh, I'm coming back now. <laughs> yeah. The truth, the honest truth is I want Nelson back. And I've told him that for years because um, he brings the best out of me. He inspired me. I bring the best out of him. It would be a great final, a great event. And we're both really good friends. You know, we both root for each other. And there's a running joke that if I get close to his number five, then he's going to have to come back because he does not want me to tie his record or, or to beat it. And that's okay. So right. yeah, I would love him to be back. Um, who knows who would win? I mean, he's got more experience. I'm, I'm better at cards, which is the final event. We'll see. But maybe it would take it to an epic showdown. Um, yeah, I don't know. It adds to the visualization for sure, because I think it would make me more excited and more amped up. If someone that caliber would compete, then I would have to train harder, right? right. Because I think at this point, 
not that it was easy to win, but I knew I was the favorite. I knew I was the best. There was no problem feeling that, visualizing that. So if Nelson's in the mix, <laughs> it upped well, it up the game a little bit. I actually don't know your guys' ages, but do you do you not feel age as a factor or do you anticipate that it might become one? Zero factor. Yeah. It's not a factor at all. I I think I'm stronger than ever mentally, emotionally, which I think is a better advantage. I'm not not comparing myself to Nelson, but comparing myself to the first time I won, I probably had better scores in 2019. But now I'm just rock solid mentally, emotionally, which is, I think that's more important to win a championship. And so to me, age, if anything, makes it better with the experience for sure. Yeah, you certainly looked rock solid. I mean, it was quite something to watch. (laughs) Um, No, no second guessing. I thought, I mean, there was like one or two cards where maybe you gave it an extra bit of thought, but I didn't see any sort of lack of confidence or or second guessing it was just more a little extra dose of certainty so to speak yeah 100 percent. that's an event you only get one mistake so i really make sure but yeah i'm 100 percent confident in those events and i don't think i've made a mistake the last two years which is uh, one of my friends pointed that out to me so that's kind of cool um yeah. but that's also the point right i mean you're not supposed to make any mistakes in these things you know i thought that was the rule i have to say that you know, I've only competed the once for a charitable outcome with Dave Farrow. And the thing mm-hmm. that I'm proud of is exactly that. He he doubled my amount, but at least I didn't make a mistake. Everything that I named was 100% correct, which all things considered, to me, I think that was quite extraordinary. Frankly, I'm surprised. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Uh, but, um, with uh, these things in mind about the memory technique, techniques themselves relative to competition has anything changed like have you changed your use of the techniques discovered some new angle or is it that you're really just using the the same techniques in the same way Hmm. the last two championships i've won uh, i've kind of relied on my um relied on my years of past training, meaning I don't train as hard as I used to. Um, anything new, the only thing I, I continue to do, it's mandatory for me, is just pressure training. Push-ups, noise in my ear, podcasts in my ear, um, fast audio. I mean, AI is out there. I haven't utilized that yet to really script things out, but you have to do that if you're going to compete on stage. Like. Right. So but nothing new. You're nothing memorizing new. while you're doing push-ups or practicing? I'll do push-ups and then immediately jump up. Like I'll hold my breath and do push-ups and immediately jump up and press play on the audio for like the tea party event. And it's just, and then I increase the the speed of the person talking. So it's faster than normal. So it's like, it's just chaos. And in that moment, my mind is like, F this, like, just give up, like, do it calmer, like, this sucks. And like, it's screaming at me to stop, like, don't do it. This, you can't keep up. This is, they're talking too fast. And if you can train with that voice in your head, just like, stop, stop, stop. This is annoying. No, no, no. Then you're going to do really well when it comes to pressure because you can handle, because that's what I do. I like, I get on stage and yeah, it's hard because it's under pressure and under lights and stressors, but it's almost easier than what I train for. I'm like, I can do this. I can do this. And I think that's what a lot of people miss is they're training in per I used to do this training perfect conditions with your headphones or your earmuffs on. It's perfectly silent. And no, no, no. No, no, no. That doesn't do you any good. I mean, initially when you're learning it, but right, right. So nothing to do. Just I don't like doing it, but I have to do it if I'm gonna win. Yeah. So it's just a commitment to that chaos. So there's the tactic, everybody. Add distraction don't run away from it which i think would be a good thing for your memory practice period when you're learning languages and using mnemonics or formulas for chemistry etc if you can practice in distraction including distractions of of your own mind internal distractions you're going to improve your technique overall so speaking of things that have changed and voices in our heads and so forth 
let's go into more interesting territory since nothing has changed about the memory techniques as such mnemonics are mnemonics probably not going to change maybe the shadow will evolve into something else but whatever the the techniques themselves are quite stable and people can learn about them from other sources so i don't know the perfect place to start with this idea of transformation and whatnot but you and i share in common basically something that's a little deeper and I think other people have. I mean, I've read in the record from Robert Flood, Giordano Bruno, even Aristotle in topics and metaphysics has this kind of thing where he doubts his own scientific certainty, sort of sweeps it under the rug. And th there is the impulse towards, I don't know what the best word is, because I don't think there is a, a word for it actually, but let's call it mystical or let's call it metaphysical or something like something where there's a light or there's a, a a purpose that reveals itself somehow. And it feels like weird, strange, spooky territory and so forth. And yet I think that actually I can be at least scientific about it. And I really like talking with you about it because you know, what, even if we see it a little bit differently, you know what I'm talking about. And I think I know what you're talking about. And it's just this amazing effect of memory training. So I don't know how that is for a start on the conversation, but that's the way it came out. Yeah. I mean, there's spirituality too. People talk about it. Um, but yeah, I've, I've had some really wild experiences mentally, emotionally, spiritually, you know, people talk about out of body, people talk about <laughs> psychic abilities, things like that. I've had a lot of crazy experiences in the last, well, since 2011, uh, more so this year, it's really been amped up in the last year or so. But um, there is a bridge with memory. You know, we we're talking about this before that in memory, you use your imagination. Your imagination is key. Well, what is imagination? And I, I believe fully that you're not storing things in your brain, in your physical brain. You're using a mind. You're using a realm a non-physical realm of imagination, which is real. It's the same state you access when you dream. And you're accessing a state, like a state of consciousness and, that, and using your imagination to create something in that, you know, Joe Dispenza might call it the quantum field. It's all something you're creating with your mind, with your thoughts, with your feelings. And it's real because it's, you're experiencing it. You're creating it. You're using it. And you're pulling it back into your brain and to translate it into information or whatever you're using it for. Um, so I think that's the bridge is I've gotten insanely good at using my imagination, probably better than any, you know, seven year old even, <laughs> maybe <laughs> not, but, but that's the bridge is um, what, are, what are dreams and what is imagination and what is all this realm of possibility out there? That's not that we don't see touch and feel in this concrete world this meat suit, whatever you want to call it, this physical body. So I think, yeah, in 2011, I was opened up to this. Um, I heard about channeling these people who like, you've, you've seen probably, you could YouTube it right now, go down the rabbit hole, but these people who like close their eyes and like supposedly channel, channel a, an angel or an entity or some non-physical being. And you're like, what the heck are, these people are crazy. And I was like, what is this? Because there's Abraham Hicks, who's really incredibly popular. There's Bashar. I mean, you could really go down this. I'm like, what is this? These people claim to be psychic. They claim to be like letting an entity flow through them as their voice and speak out. And in 2011, I got into it, like really skeptical, mind you, thinking this is nuts. But what I listening to these things i'm like they can't possibly be making this stuff up like as quickly as it's coming out and it's also very not all of it very loving very wise very like what, what is this so if you look around you know like the bible channeled texts you know there are books out there in the bible there are people that where a voice spoke to them where they're speaking in tongues. That's all channeling. All I can do all that stuff too. I mean, this is where I kind of think of, 
a bit of a a memory issue, really, because there's procedural memory training, there's implicit memory, which would be, let's say there there was somebody divinely inspired or not. If memory is real, then having had exposure to all of that at an early age, and then a lot of practice with it, that emergence of those things that to me that that's not that that surprising. Um, you anyway, know, I sort of interrupted me because I've spent oh. a lot of time speaking in voices, but and being around people who speak in voices. Um, but nonetheless, uh, yeah, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm, I'm trying to to see how that that um, there, there, there may be like an actual memory science explanation to to those kinds of things. But carry on. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think just where I'm going with it is. I started seeing it more and more like when you are inspired and you're speaking from the heart, you're channeling, mm. you're bringing forth something that's more powerful and unfiltered. It's not filtered through your mind or or your fear. When you're sitting in the shower and an idea pops in your head, that's a channeled idea. Where does that come from? So like I'm bringing a question of where, where is this stuff coming from that's being pulled in? And to be able to spit out her as an idea, because every single thing, and you've heard this before, every single thing you can see, touch, and feel was once an idea. A table, a chair, a computer was here first. Yeah. Where did it come from? And people say, oh, creativity, but that's too general. That's too easy of an answer. Yeah. And so this is where you can really go down the rabbit hole of what is this quantum field? What is this reality? What is this consciousness? What is like, where are we pulling this stuff from? And I think that's, and that was what, 12 years ago. And here I am 12 years later, having just really insane connections to this experiences that I think many of you guys listening have had really wild synchronicities, dream experiences, out of body telepathy, like you've had experiences that can't be explained that you're afraid to talk about around your friends and family. That's okay. But everyone's like probably sitting there nodding like, yeah, yeah. Let's mm -hmm. talk about this more in society. And I think that's where we are is this is all very, very soon. I think we're all going to be able to talk about this as if it's normal. I think something's going to blow open here really quickly mm -hmm. where more of the truth's going to come out. Yeah. Well, that, that's an interesting thing. So you're right. Like we need to be able to talk about it more, but also at the same time, you know, I just watched a thing with Rupert Sheldrake in a debate with Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer is like <laughs> the arch skeptic and Rupert Sheldrake is much more open to uh, his definition of scientific inquiry. And one of the things that I think quite rightly um, Shermer says to Sheldrake is, you know these ideas are not as as um, unspoken about as 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 you think. I mean, even at the event that they were at, there were people who don't agree about quantum physics. They don't agree about string theory and all that sort of stuff. And they're having this rational debate. One of the areas where things come to be a little bit problematic for the science, like the arch scientists and so forth, which I feel more uh, closely akin to. Mm -hmm. But I'm aware of I'm akin to it for reasons that have to do with psychological payoffs when these things were established in my memory. So I always, I'm skeptical of my own skepticism, basically, uh, is what I'm saying. But I want to like follow through this line of thinking, because I, I think that that I would probably align with Shermer a little bit more because of what I was suggesting to you earlier. Jeffrey Klentner calls it the cosmic stop sign. And it seems like some people just place that cosmic stop sign somewhere else. So basically, I have these experiences too. And so my question is, why is it that not only am I skeptical of it, but I'm skeptical of my skepticism. And then I kind of ultimately return to, you know, the stop sign is here. And that is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. I can't give that evidence other than I notice these other people in history talking about it. I myself am experiencing it and I still talk about it, but then other people put the stop sign elsewhere. And they're, you know, why? And then, you know, that's where I start to sort of, fil uh, you know, filter things and and try to come at truth. And then truth for me is super nuanced because I don't think there is such a thing as truth in the same way 
that a lot of people do and science itself wouldn't. Science is continual testing. Okay, so that stands for now. Let's test it again, right? Like it's not like there's any truth. And not only that, unless block time theory is real and we're going backwards in time instead of forward in time and like all that sort of stuff, right? All of reality is probably coming into being at the same time, which means mm -hmm. that truth is actually contingent, not, nece not, not necessary, but contingent. And it is itself an evolving property. So <laughs> lots of responses there, but you know, what do you think? <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, you're basically saying the theory of everything's happening right now, past, present, future, there is no, right. And if that's the case, then yeah, things can change. Your past can change. And I have a really weird belief based on my experience, based on the work that I do. So just a brief background. I, I believe in time travel that you can do this right now. And it's not in a ship, a DeLorean, like you think, but when I went through, I don't know, we, did we even talk about this in a past podcast? I, I suffered from panic attacks. I suffered from anxiety and really, really scary stuff, like debilitating mental stuff. And the way that I moved through that, like it's completely gone now. And I actually help people with this. This is literally what I do for a living now is I help people a lot of suicidal thoughts um, depression, anxiety, just really nasty stuff. Cause I, I, now I understand where it comes from. Why am I sharing this? Because the reason you have anxiety, for example, is because of echoes of the past. So you don't, anxiety is not an emotion below anxiety is fear or sadness or anger that are com emotions that are completely unrelated from the, the worry you have in the moment. So let's say you wake up and you're just heavy all over the body. You're dreading the day. You're worried about everything, finances, stress, and you're just so tense. You're living in anxiety. Well, the reason you have anxiety is not because of your bills and your to-do list and because of your day. Your anxiety is because of past events in your life that you couldn't handle, right? So People like to say the word trauma. I don't use that word because it it's events in your life that were so stressful or uncomfortable that you stored them. You trapped them in your nervous system. You trapped them in your emotional body and they're suppressed emotions. So they build up over a lifetime. You know, when you were third grade and you were bullied, you trapped that. When you were five years old and you were in the grocery store and you you went around the corner and you lost mom and you panicked. That's a trapped emotion. It's literally when you're sitting there in bed, waking up as a 37 year old or whatever age, and you're in dread. It's because of the three year old self or five year old self who panicked at the grocery store that the events that are going to transpire later that day are reminding your body, your nervous system of the same worries of the same panics of the past or angers of the past and they're triggering in your nervous system and your nervous system is causing a physical reaction and then the thoughts come mm -hmm. so your anxiety is not because of your to-do list it's because of your five-year-old self or your third grade self or even your 15 year old self even all of these things sparking at the same time causing that and when i realized that like obviously there's more to it than that but when I realize that, and here's where it comes to time travel, <laughs> the way you feel that is you go back in time. You literally close your eyes and get in a contemplative state. And you relive the moments of the past that still have that sizzle. Mm. And you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. There are moments of the past, people you don't like, there are things that bother you. You relive those moments one at a time from a different perspective. And this is what I teach my clients. But anyway, not to go into the details of that, but when you go back to that and relive that in a safe way and you feel the feelings and allow those feelings to go through you and you see the other person's perspective and feel that too, and you get the gift out of it, what happens is you neutralize that emotion. That sizzle is no longer. Mm literally gone and from that it heals out of your nervous system and it doesn't affect you anymore and the more you do this you don't wake up with anxiety anymore because you're not bothered by anything and, and you literally went back in time 
to when you were in third grade, you relived an event and you neutralized that event. Yeah. And that's time travel. That's time travel because you're changing the charge mm. of something that happened in third grade by seeing it in a different way, by reliving it, and you change the past, in my view, which changes the future, which changes the present. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm into that, uh, so to speak. <laughs> I mean, that uh, I'm just tidying up now the draft of my book on Giordano Bruno, and in it, I just felt called to share how I did, did something exactly like what you're saying. So I memorized the Nirvana Shatakam, and I chose the memory palace as a home that I had some trauma, sorry to use that word. I know you don't want to use it, but um, I had some really traumatic things happen. And for whatever reason, I mean, and this is an interesting kind of thing, whatever reason, but um, I just felt called to use that place as a memory palace, even though it was hard for me to do it. And it was especially hard because one of the lingering things that kept coming back to me is like a bitterness over the episodes in that particular building with the people who were involved, and so then I memorized the thing. And the thing with the Nirvana Shatakam that's especially interesting is that part of what the Sanskrit says is I'm not my body, I'm not my mind, I'm not my memory, including not being even your own memory, right? It's creating this sort of distance from it. And it just felt very right to, to memorize that particular piece in that. And then after I'm done, just forgiveness floods towards that whole situation. And now I can... This is quite nuanced, or it's not that nuanced, but it's quite multi-layered. So I can actually think about those things without having an emotional response. I can also be unbothered by the fact that I ever did have an emotional response, which because, you know, there's like years of mentally harping on that particular point and all the you know, biographical details around that. So I totally get all of that. Mm -hmm. I guess the cosmic stop sign, so to speak, for me is... When I get to questions of like, well, why was I called to do that particular thing? I find it a little bit hard to think that there, if all things are happening right now, right? Then what is the thing outside of now that would call me to make those things or channel it or like any of those things? That That's sort of where I think for me, and, and this is where I think maybe it's just an image that's useful for me and I get more pleasure or more outcome out of it than others. So I'm not uh, dismissing anybody else's uh, framework. But for me, it's just like, it's way more empowering to just think, okay, so reality is coming into being. It it builds itself out of itself. So there isn't necessarily any reason why it happened. It just happened and it's because there's a recursion in information. Information ultimately pools up set theory would guarantee that it starts to point back to itself and you know math stuff and blah 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 and like does it have to be quantum like what would what would it be in quantum add to it for me it adds nothing to it i mean what add, added something to it is that it happened and now i'm free so um that's kind of my cosmic stop sign on all of that and i worry about just creating additional suffering because what if i have another traumatic situation and then it doesn't work now who do i blame you know, do I blame the memory techniques? Do I blame the outside force that gave me this previous, you know, wonderful release and solace? So, you know, that's where I, I wouldn't want to create future suffering by adding an extra element <laughs> that I later get to blame, which would just start the suffering game all over again. That's why I think Buddha says, if you meet me, kill me, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> I think that's, that's part of that very, very wise saying, you meet the Buddha, you kill the Buddha. Like, Immediately, even if even if you're not sure it's the Buddha, it looks like a Buddha. Boom. <laughs> oh Sounds savage, God. I guess. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I throw that out there. Yeah, I mean, cosmic stop sign. I, it's an interesting term because, yeah, to me, it means like, where do you stop with this? You mm -hmm. know, because once the floodgates open on your experiences and you meditate and have these things happen, and like, where do you stop? When does it stop? And to me, it doesn't. <laughs> it just if anything, it exponentially or logarithmically increases. Mm. And it's it's not scary, but it's just so expansive. It's mind boggling what's mm. out there. But yeah, to me, I think like you, I need you need to be skeptical. You can't just believe everything you hear and read and see or, you know, like, oh, and have a meaning to it. You have to really question it and know thyself, know what's happening. But um 
I mean, there's so many ways to go here. I mean, there's, I think, you know, just sharing a, going on what we're talking about with the emotional stuff. The reason I bring up this too is because this is, I believe, the healing the emotional traumas. The reason I don't use the word trauma is because I personally hated that word when I heard about it. I was like, I've never had trauma. I don't have trauma. Like, I was never abused. Mm. I was never whatever. So I can't say I was traumatized, but the truth is every single person hearing this has things that bother them, has events that I'm talking about that are trapped and suppressed. Um, anyway, healing this stuff with forgiveness. By the way, forgiveness is not about forgiving the other person for what they did. It's about forgiving your perception, your judgment of what happened, your narrow view of what happened. Mm -hmm. um, that's another discussion. But healing this stuff I just went gangbusters on this forgiveness, healing the stuff, releasing this stuff. And when that happened, a profound physiological, spiritual, emotional change happened to me. It like woke me the F up in a, in a scary way where these experiences started happening stronger, where I was in the present moment. Because think about this, Anthony, like past, present, future. So many of us are, when you're in anxiety, you're living in the future. You're not even here right now. When I had anxiety, I I was here, but I was not here. I was planning, worried, whatever. When you're depressed, you're, you're worried about the past. You're, But if you're present, fully, which how many of us can say that? Healing this stuff keeps you in this moment locked in. Not 100%. Like you got to keep coming back and working on it. But it, when it's also activates your heart it takes you out of here which is wonderful and powerful but it puts you in here mm. hopefully you can see me on the video my heart right your heart is like 10 times 100 times more powerful than your mind and staying locked and loaded in the present moment trusting your feelings luke you know star wars style is so freaking powerful because you get these intuitive hits and these downloads and these moments of inspiration and you channel through like right now i don't have anything in front of me saying notes or like make sure to put this on the podcast or bullet points i'm just speaking from my heart and sharing my experiences and i think you can do that more mm. you're not so worried and so that's what changed for me healing the emotional stuff in, inside of me where really nothing bothers me anymore i mean it shouldn't say nothing because i'm not fully there but <laughs> very little bothers me mm because I've time traveled and taken care of that stuff, right? I'm locked in this moment. I'm having spiritual experiences. I'm having psychic, mental like experience, whatever you want to call it. But for me, that was the gateway. Right, right. And I think that is the gateway for everyone. That bitterness that you talked about, I think that's a wonderful story. Um, I think we, that's, everyone wants to have these spiritual experiences. Here's your, listen to this right now, what I'm about to share with you. Because I think, you can go do ayahuasca if you want or smoke weed. I've never done ayahuasca. But I'm saying like you can have this spiritual experience every day and know what we're talking about. Activate your third eye if you want to, whatever. Mm -hmm. If you heal the shit that's inside of you. Because if you're living in fear and you have suppressed anger and you're worried all the time or you're procrastinating or there's, there's something still trapped that's unresolved. And if you try to meditate and all you think of is crap from the day or worries from the day, that's your sign. Like right now, I'm telling you, work through that stuff. Because if it doesn't bother you anymore, now you're here and now, and now you're going to have wonderful experiences. So that's what opened up for me. Um, not an ayahuasca trip or, you know, whatever people are doing these days. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but that's real for me. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. What comes to mind is, and I want to, the, the direct question is, when you say you went gangbusters on it, you know, what did you do? And just as a, a, a thought about it, a lot of our ideas about meditation are these sit and breathe and suppress thoughts. But there's actually another style of meditation, which is called discursive meditation. And discursive meditation is kind of like what you're saying. Go back and deal with that stuff. It can be through journaling. It can be through time traveling in your mind, uh, working things out. 
can be through, you know, a combination of all those things, but discursive meditation is, is just as much meditation, even though it's a little bit more mental oriented and, you know, the whole Tantra thing where you imagine images and uh, you push through chakras and all that sort of stuff. That's like mental activity that is discursive as opposed to trying to eliminate thought. So when you say you went gangbusters, I mean, what are, what are, or are you able to, or willing to share, you know, more about what that means and yeah. what the yeah. outcomes are, what, what it's like to, yeah. to have those, uh, those feelings of whatever we call them, you know, uh, enlightenment or freedom from, from the mind or yeah. or getting deeper into the mind so that your freedom comes from just being your mind, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Can you imagine having no anxiety and living in peace? Like that's, that's the way I live now. It's insane. It's as good as you would imagine it to be. Um, but you, this is something I do in depth with my clients and, and really regiment and like keep them in this because you have, you can't just do it once and like, Oh, it's all gone. It doesn't work like that. Um, but I'll say this, like what I talked about time traveling, I call it something different, but really face and make peace with the things that bother you. So you have to be aware of what's bothering you. Sometimes it's subtle. Sometimes it's a person you don't like a thing that's happened, but you have to make peace with that. You have to, because I mean, if you don't, that's okay, but you're haunted with it every day, whether you realize it or not, you're, when you're frustrated, that someone emailed you something to do, or you're frustrated that someone talked over you, that frustration is because of something unresolved in the past. It's not has nothing to do with the email or the person. When you realize that, it's like, well, why do I want to keep this stuff in my body and my nervous system? So anyway, I do that. Um, you also have to learn how to handle emotions. So we are not taught correctly. We're so think about this as kids, you're a young toddler, you're screaming your head off, and you're what does your mom do? They you say, stop crying, or here's a sucker, or go, you know, distract. What we do is we teach our kids that, you know, in society in general, right? We know what I'm talking about. Like, go, you know, stop, stop crying. Here's a sucker, here's a TV show. What you're doing, think about it with yourself. When you're sitting there and you're frustrated or you're miserable, what do you do? You go grab your phone and you scroll. You try to calm down. You go on a walk. You watch a show. That's distraction. That's avoidance. That's not what you should do when you're feeling a frustration or a fear or a sadness. Okay? And you should also not fight it. So, or react to it. So if you're angry, you shouldn't like yell and punch the other person. That's react. That's going into it, right? Fear, um, pushing it away, pretending it's not happened, fighting it, arguing with your thoughts. Like, no, 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 I'm powerful. No, 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 I'm grateful. Like, that's all fighting. You're at it. You're fighting. So fighting an emotion, a negative emotion, I should say, or avoiding it are the two worst things you can do because essentially what you're doing is you're keeping that emotion in. You're not letting it resolve and pass through you. So something that bothers you today, someone cut you off in traffic. You got tense and pissed, right? Again, that's from a past bundle of things that are reminding you of something you don't like. Mm -hmm. And it's trying, the, the reason you tense up is because you're holding it in. This emotion is trying to leave you, your nervous system, your emotional body. It's trying to pass through you. So you have to relax through it. You have to feel it. This is something no one wants to do. If you're, if you're angry or sad or in fear, you have to feel that feeling. Mm -hmm. It's uncomfortable, but you sit, relax, and feel it. And when you do that, you allow it to pass through you. You allow your body to neutralize that from the past, pieces of it from the past. Okay, that's part of it. You have to be doing this and aware of it consistently through the day. Because if you're reactive to stuff, you're just going to spiral in it and keep it in. So that's part of it is knowing what to do when it comes up. Knowing what to do to heal the big stuff from the past. And then the third thing I'll say is you have to understand your mind. 
the voice in your head. <laughs> the voice in your head, the ego, is a construct that you built throughout your life. You allowed society, parents, teachers, everything to kind of like unconsciously absorb into a structure to make sense of the world. Mm -hmm. And here's a here's a kind of creepy thing. Your voice in your head is kind of like the voice of your parents. If you really sit there and think about it, it's, it's <laughs> it doesn't sound like your parents, but it's telling you the same thing like you shouldn't do that or you're not good enough for that or I know do this first you have to do this first to be good enough. like it'll say stuff like that mm. it comes from good meaning people i'm not saying blame your parents for any of this but what i'm saying is you have to understand the ego is a construct it is a it is a survival mind it's mm. meant to keep you safe and familiar so if you've been beaten and conditioned your whole life into this like not physically beaten but just like held down into guilt and shame and fear and anger you're going to conform to that. Your mind, that voice in your head will keep you in a familiar safety, which isn't really safe at all. Mm. But it keeps you from speaking out. It keeps you from some people from starting a business, from whatever. You know, it holds you down. It keeps you from moving forward. It keeps you depressed and, and anxious because you listen to this thing mm. and you believe it. It's not, it's not you. That voice is not you, because you can listen to it. Do you think there is a you? That's a good question. Yeah, who is you? <laughs> I believe um, Michael Singer opened me up to this. I love the man. He saved my life, I should say. Um, just just saved me from panic and anxiety. It was one of the trigger points that helped me through this. But yeah, he asked that question, Who who am I? And I, I, very simply, it's like you're aware right now, right? We're all aware. At least that's the illusion. But <laughs> yeah. But you're also aware that you're aware. Mm. Who is aware that you're aware right now? Like sit and pa pause this right now and contemplate that for a second. That will blow you open if you really understand what I just said. Yeah. You're aware but you're also aware what what's back here. That's aware that you're aware. It ain't this body. It's not this brain. It's something consciousness. It's awareness. Like, what is that? That will open you up mm -hmm. to realize you're not your mind. You're not your voice. And so that will take you down the rabbit hole, that contemplation alone. Yeah. Some traditions call it the witness. And in the, Bhagavad Gita, it's, you know, the, the, the knower of the field that knows that the field and the knower of the field are not separate, but they're integrated or they're, they're one, but some people just have that awareness a little less than others. But when you know the person who knows the, that they are the field and they are the knower of the field and the knower that knows that there is a knower of the field, then you start to have these, uh, sort of enlightenment experience experiences, um, but I think the question of personhood is 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 super interesting and a very difficult one. And, mm -hmm. you know, I know I always go back to my old Giordano Bruno thing, but uh, that's partly because I'm just finishing up this book. But one of the extraordinary things about his execution was that they delayed it. And one of the reasons they delayed it is because they wanted to make sure that he wasn't right. <laughs> they were also worried that he had um, a lot of friends that he'd made in his travels through Europe who might attack uh, Italy mm -hmm. or whatever, you know, maybe not attack with their armies, but you know, maybe, uh, but the other thing that they were concerned about, and they had to check that he wasn't correct about this is that not only did he not think that Jesus was the son of God, but he didn't even think that it's possible to be a person. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the major delays is that they were just like, well, wait, that, that could be possible. And if I yank this back a little bit into like science of memory, just what I know of it, I'm not uh, necessarily uh, enough educated, but nonetheless, I think that part of what is happening with people like Bruno is that they know that they're experiencing themselves as a type. 
So he told his executioners that he he said, you fear your decision to kill me more than I do, right? And he kind of like knows that, yeah, okay, Jesus did these things. Like it's irrelevant whether he was the son of God or not. There's there's all kinds of people who come up that they have these spiritual experiences and then their mouths start going blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to be the last one. You kill me. I'll be back. You know, not that he will be back, but just the tendency, the trend. You could think of Jungian archetypes. You could think of all these kinds of things. But I also have the feeling that he probably was aware enough of his awareness that he knew that he actually, he was a memory expert of his time. He talked about the brain and all sorts of things. He knew he was trained to be Bruno, (laughs) so to speak. So it's not like he, it's not like he was ever going to be able to make himself shut up. He saw something that was wrong. He saw that the universe was infinite and, you know, the the mouth just followed. So he, he, he was, he was destined, so to speak, to, to be their enemy and there was no stopping it. So he sort of leaned into it. Um, So, yeah, I, I, I I think uh, when we can drop personhood, when we can see the conditioning, then we can kind of lean into it and be a little bit freer to be who we yeah. are. And fortunately, we live in a time where there's not that much persecution, although it still persists. Right. Well, talk about a, a bold belief <laughs> that you're more than, than your body to like mm. lean into possibly being executed, um, knowing that you're going to live forever, knowing that, okay, this body's gone, but that's not you anyways. That's, that's insane. Um, mm. And I heard this recently that I, I don't, I don't know where this came from, but animals, your cat, your dog are more spiritually enlightened than you because they are, they know that when they die, they're moving on and evolving into something else. They're moving on anyway. It's like, this is just uh, serving a purpose. Anyway, there's something to think about. Well, but I think Eckhart Tolle says, I think Eckhart Tolle says, I've known many Zen masters, all of them cats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There you go. Yeah. Well, I mean, what do you think about these these things about reincarnation? I mean, I think just mathematically things repeat and, you know, there's set theory and a set starts to refer to itself and, you know, that sort of thing. But if anybody is the uh, reincarnation of Giordano Bruno, it sure as heck isn't me. It's probably more someone like Jordan Peterson, right? Mm-hmm. Because he's having all these kinds of spiritual experiences and he is arguing in a very subtle way that most people can't handle. That's why there's all kinds of swarming against him. And, and what I read, and maybe I'm wrong, but what I interpret it f- from him is that it's actually irrelevant whether it's true or not, right? What matters is that these things have an effect on us and, you know, the, the logos and yada, yada, yada. It can be the case that it's just having an effect, you know, r- regardless of whether it's true or not. So metaphorical truth is something that's often wiped under the rug and a lot of people can't quite get through things that are true and not true at the same time. Uh, they're like non-contradictory uh, contradictions or true contradictions as they're sometimes called or para consistencies. So, yeah, I mean, if I'm going to believe in reincarnation, that's what I'm going to say that he's like a Bruno figure and, and maybe he even is Bruno. I don't think that, but you know, Bruno if, if reincarnated, yeah. yeah, well, I'll say this, you know, I, I was highly skeptical of this idea of <clears throat> reincarnation and past lives. I grew up Catholic, you know, mm-hmm. which is not a part of you get one life, right? And that, anyway, what opened me up dramatically to this idea, and I believe it now to my core, I'll let you decide. But there's a woman, she's since deceased, named Dolores Cannon. Look her up. She was a hypnotherapist she's like she looks like your grandma like from alabama she's -hmm. from alabama she looks like his grandma like this but she is like (laughs) the grandmother of metaphysical i don't know she's insane she was a hypnotherapist back in the day developed her own method for taking her clients under and helping them with with different ailments or whatever just normal hypnotherapy but she kind of tweaked her method to take people deeper and ask them different questions so she was doing thousands of sessions over the years and she would take people deep and ask them to go back into a memory of their life. Kind of like what I'm talking about time travel, right? Mm -hmm. What she discovered was that people were going, 
when she said, go back to a, mem a previous memory of your life that's holding tight, they were starting to go back to memories of times that weren't current, like past lives, like hundreds of years prior, thousands of years prior. And she was like, what the heck is going on? But it, when it kept happening to different people, completely different people over and over and over again, she's like, okay, there's something here. Because she's leading these people under hypnosis and they're speaking about what's happening, where they are, who they are. And she started asking questions and she started going and she's written tons of books, but she noticed patterns and she was having people access past lives. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and it's, it goes down the rabbit hole even further. I mean, good luck watching a video of hers and coming out of this, you know, without <laughs> spending your night. But, but that's what opened me up is like, you need to hear someone like that, someone who's extremely skeptical, but scientifically kind of proved it. And I think that was the gateway that I needed to read about to hear is that you can't explain this stuff. When hundreds or thousands of people start doing the same thing, there's a pattern there. What is that? And so I think that I think it is valid. I think that's how we learn our lessons mm. is we keep repeating. Our soul keeps repeating life. And we've probably been here, many of us, many times. Yeah. Did I ever tell you my past life experience? No. Oh, so, maybe. <laughs> uh, I don't remember, ironically. <laughs> oh, well, it's quite interesting, actually especially so here we can talk about synchronicity also I, I don't believe it's a synchronicity necessarily and i don't necessarily believe in uh reincarnation but i i would leave it to longer data sets uh, let's put it that way but anyway so georgina cannon not dolores cannon but georgina cannon is who that i learned hypnosis from and this is something i did in my dissertation so i'm a certified hypnotherapist and i have nlp and all that stuff uh that i did but I didn't do it to be a practitioner. I did it because it was part of my research in my dissertation for friendship, because I thought hypnosis might be part of friendship. Uh, if not literal hypnosis, you know, we we kind of put each other in trance, that sort of thing. So I was exploring all that stuff. Anyway, so Georgina Cannon, she teaches us automatic writing and other things like just trying to access a past life. So I'm in this exercise. It's it's a student who is hypnotizing me, not not. Uh, Georgina, but all of a sudden I am just in a fighter plane. I don't have any knowledge of what exact kind of a uh, fighter plane it is, but nonetheless, I'm being shot down and we're, hit, we're cruising to the earth and it is so extraordinarily real. I've never, well, I have had experiences that are as real as that before, but it was like shockingly real, especially because I don't really visualize, but this was seen, felt, heard, smelled all that stuff. And it totally kind of, uh, uh, rocked my world for like a couple of weeks. And in uh, the 48 hours after that or whatever, I wrote a piece that I called Automatic Gym, which is published in a book called Lex Talionis Schadenfreude. <laughs> we get into what all that means at some other time. It's not quite visible on the shelf, but it's right here, this book, Lex Talionis Schadenfreude. And the whole thing is just me channeling, so to speak, the memories of my life, so to speak, as a gym. And I called it automatic gym because I was allowing this automatic writing. And it's just weird, like the stuff that came out of it. The only thing is, is that I don't really believe <laughs> that I am a reincarnation of a guy who was in a fighter jet in what seems in my memory right. to be World War II. And I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't really see the use of debating about like, because I could never prove that I wasn't, right? Can't prove a negative. But what do you think, I mean, I know what the value was for me, but what do you think what possible value is found in those who are, are quite convinced that, that, that these things are true? Because that's the thing I can never quite find. I always say, okay, so it's true. So what? I mean, what's the so what on the other end of, if I say right now, what changes if I go, yeah, I was automatic gym. And, uh, you know, I work on it more and maybe I discover more things about his life, you know? I mean, what, what do you think is the, is the, the, so what at the that, end of the question? That's interesting. I mean, yeah, who knows if that was a past life, but you experienced something, right? The, so what is it opens you to more because from that's my experience. Mm. 
like I've had out of body experiences where I literally have floated out of my body, looked down, I've seen my body, I've seen my bed, I've floated through my walls, I've floated up and flew in the night sky, peaceful, calm, real. How do you like? <laughs> so, what is that? I don't fully know exactly what happened, but I know what ha- kind of like you, something was real here. Mm. But the so what for me has led to more, more openings and different doors. But yeah, the thing is like, I don't have an operation manual to know exactly what this was, exactly what I saw and felt. Mm. That's the kind of frustrating part for me is like someone or something just tell me what that was, Mm. you know? But I, it, for me, it's just open more because it's it's the same thing with learning. You know, just you read this thing, which gets you down a rabbit hole, which gets you down a rabbit hole. But I think that rabbit hole gets you to know yourself, gets you to know what's really real and out there and, and it helps you find truth. It also, for me, I'll say this, it helps me see through the illusions of the matrix <laughs> <laughs> of this physical reality. You can and I it's hard to describe, but you see the, you see when you experience stuff outside of yourself, it just breaks down this illusion of that. We all believe we're sitting here and we're separate. We believe you and I are separate and this chair is separate and that person is separate and this conflict, this war is separate. And we're, we believe that, but I believe that's an illusion that, we are not separate. Is there's a complete veil erased our memory put over us to believe that in order to experience? And then that question goes, okay, so what? Well, why? 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 And be keep asking why you're you start getting answers and truths and knowings for yourself. So that's the so what for me is when does this end? where does this go? What does this end? And it just has never, it's like a drinking through a fire hose at this point. <laughs> Well, I like the idea of having an operating manual. I think that we, you and I would agree that part of the operating manual is memory training and ex- exploration of memory even larger and beyond just training it. Although I think you're probably much easier or you have an easier time exploring what your memory is if you have spent some time with mnemonics. So I think that's part of the operating manual. And if you have mm-hmm. you know more to say on that specific piece of it, that'd be great. But also what even if you don't know what the operating manual is, what do you think would need to be in an operating manual in order to get more openness and more experience? I don't know. That's kind of where I'm at now. Mm. Um, but what I'll say is my, my brain wants to know it all. It's why I got into memory. It's why I've, I've always wanted to soak everything and read up every book, store it and remember it, right? Or just to have access to that. And here's the spooky thing is the less, the more I let go of and push away, like I don't try to remember everything and categorize it and operation manual it. You know, I still have that tendency. But what I'm saying is if you get quiet, contemplative, you're calm, you're relaxed, and you ask a question, and I dare you to do this, ask, assertively ask for the answer. You will get it Mm. every time. And so like, why do I need an operation manual when I can get access to any answer I want in that moment? Something I need, a nudge, an insight of wisdom. So that's been my experience lately of asking very directly for what I need and getting that insight in the shower or right then and there in the back of my mind. And you have to trust it. I mean, this is, some of you might be so up in your head that you don't understand what I'm talking about. Like, I'm not insulting you. I'm actually understanding you because you're trying to like, I used to like, what's the step-by-step here? What do I do? What I need to sit contemplatively and do this and like, so far up my head, Mm. relax, get out of your head. If anything, calm that clutter. But I think, I don't know, it, it, you get the answers when you need them. And I don't know if I need an operation manual at this point, because I think I'm just enjoying 
what's happening here and now and the journey it's taking me on and the questions I'm asking and the layers it's peeling. So yeah, I don't know the answer to your questions. I don't know even how memory can fully help with us too. Um, <laughs> it's a rabbit <laughs> hole for sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I think our history in the memory tradition has some ideas. So Robert Flood, for example, he had an image of a black square. And this is my interpretation. I could be totally off and imposing my own <laughs> ideas on it, but I, I don't think so. I think I'm quite scholarly in my research and density of thinking through these things. Because Robert Flood, Jordana Bruno, lots of these guys, Alexander Dixon, all these guys in, our, in our, the history of memory techniques, the reason why they're preserved really is from their work. They wanted to memorize everything. They, they actually thought you could know everything. And Flood puts this black square, um, which I think it says, ad, 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 ad sick ad infinitum, which is like, and on and on into infinity. So it's like a black square and each line has it like that, on and on and on into infinity. And what I think he's saying in there is that the opposite, of, it's like a platonic thing. Plato said, the opposite of being cannot be non-being, right? Mm -hmm. Nothing can't be nothing because in order for us to talk about nothing, nothing has to be a something. Otherwise, how can we talk about a nothing, mm -hmm. right? So this black square is expanding on and on and on. And so the, the way that they reconcile the idea that you really can know everything, you really can memorize everything is because in order to have memorized everything, you would have to have an image of you having memorized nothing as a potentiality, right? And you would have to realize that in everything would be the version of you in which there would be incompleteness. Hmm. Does that sort of follow? I, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong to it, but, and, and maybe they're just cheating. <laughs> and, you know, oh, the reason why I didn't know the answer to that question or the reason why I forgot is because there's some parallel universe in which that's totally valid for me to have done that and still be the guy who knew it all, right? But I think th there's even something more profound, which is a Zen thing, which is, you know, as far as we know, there's the now, only the now. And if you get caught in, well, as the Buddha says in Dhammapada, uh, no net like delusion. You know, like if you get caught in all those sorts of delusions, well, then you're not quite there yet. You have to also see that possibility that everything you think is is not only deluding you, but helping you delude yourself. <laughs> so, you know, it's uh, quite intricate. Anyway, the black square is is something to uh, to think about. Yeah, and it was, it's definitely it was, a trip of a thought experiment to contemplate that. Yeah. And that's another uh, thing know. about like the operating manual is that a lot of these guys, they did what's called sacred geometry. So they would draw these things for themselves. And this is kind of interesting when we talk about like the mind not being in your mind or mine or memory not being in my mind or, or yours or whatever. Like if you take a line, right? A line is going to be distinguished by having a starting point and an ending point. But if it's a line, then it also extends past itself into infinity in that direction. So even though there are two points, it also is going to, as a line, it's going to extend infinitely. So they would draw these things. They would have experiences as a result of realizing facts about geometry. Geometry uh, means uh, measuring the earth, right? Uh, the metrics of the geo, uh, the, like the world. And then they would start to have these revelations. And then you start to think all kinds of mathematical thoughts. And it is like revelation, as you you had you know, mentioned before. Um, so... I think those mm. are part of the tool, the tool, the possible toolkits. And what is a memory palace except for playing around mm. with geometry? You know, like that. This is going to be station one. <laughs> this is going to be station two. You know, and all that sort of stuff. And we're going to move from here to here. But anybody who ever thinks they're going to run out of memory palaces, you you can. You, and this is part of what Bruno is talking about. You can replicate lines into infinity. So mm -hmm. I think these are parts of our toolkits as well. Learning to draw learning uh, to sit and contemplate the forms, uh, actual possible entelechy or whatever. Uh, Leibniz, I always love that line from Leibniz. Everything possible has an urge to exist. <laughs> I love this. Yeah, just the thought of memory palaces for a second. What's the what's the cap on memory? Like how about, 
what's the total number you could memorize? And there it's a limitless. The only thing that caps you is time mm. and energy. But does it? Right. But it is right in this physical, but it is limitless because you're not memorizing in your brain. The memory palace is in a realm of imagination of the dream world of, you know, it's it's non-physical. You're building something in that realm. But I love the mathematical. I don't, I'm not a genius, a wizard in this, but I follow Robert Edward Grant. I don't know if you know who he is. A brilliant, maybe a reincarnation of uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, I, I'm just throwing <laughs> that out to be funny, but this guy's a genius and he's talking about that. If, if you understand truths about math and contemplate that, it unlocks these epiphanies, these revelations that you're talking about. That's the thing is if you sit and you contemplate some of this stuff, it will open and burst doors open that you didn't think would open mm. just by sitting there. Where did those doors come from? I'm not talking about it's going to make you pick up another book at the library, maybe, but it's going to burst something into your mind, a new idea, a concept, or a knowing that you didn't know where that come that came from. Right. That's the excite. That's what excites me these days is these bursts. Where did this come from? Where is this? Well, now that you mentioned Da Vinci, do you think that part of what's happening right now is that with the birth of the internet, maybe even earlier with the industrial revolution and all this kind of stuff, that we have somehow lost the so-called Renaissance man, where there are people who are polymathic, they're having these mental experiences because they're just getting way more exercise. And then we come to basically industrial revolution says, okay, here's the school, here's the prison, here's the hospital, here's uh, the clock, and you show up. And if you don't, well, then either the prison or the hospital, because you're either mentally ill or you're a, a villain, you know, that sort of thing. And now we have this society that persists to this day, this organization of time in a way that, you know, is really preventing people from accessing all this information. But then the internet comes and now it's at war with uh, the the school time structure. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like we had a blip and you see this uh, with the Flynn effect to a certain extent. I mean, the Flynn effect is quite complicated, but that, you know, the IQ is going up and then at a certain point now they're, they're starting to go down. Um, huh. So. No, I, 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 have a, I have a different view of that. I think if anything, more people are polymaths and, and have levels of mind like Da Vinci once did. And Robert Edward Grant is one of them. I just mentioned it, but I think it's kind of like if you ask that question in Da Vinci's age, everyone would have looked dumbfounded like there's no one out there like that. But his stuff survived the test of time. He was somewhere in a small town in an area of the world known by a select few. And I think the same is going on. If you look, there are people out there with a genius, not a genius of academia. Mm. Of, I wrote this book and I read this thing and I am a doctor. Not nothing wrong with that, by the way. Right. But uh, let's learn how this relates to this, relates to this, relates to this, and it's all cyclical. Of philosophy is math and math is geometry and geometry is you know biology and biology is sociology. Like how these are all connected. Yeah. So I think these people do exist more so. Yeah. Well, but, that is. No. I I think you're right and. I just shot a video. I just, I'm almost approved the edit where I'm saying, look, expertise is very dangerous right now because there's all kinds of people who are proclaiming absolute truth on things that they've never actually experienced directly. They've never done. And you and I both know uh, just sometimes at a glance of a few pages that this new memory training book, that guy has not used <laughs> these techniques, you know, yeah, but it, yeah. it, it, it's been enabled. And yet th there are ideas in the minds of very impressive memory competitors that may never wind their, up in a book just because they're not interested in being authors or YouTubers or podcasters or what have you, right? So, Are you telling me to write a book? No, I'm just kidding. I, would, I oh. wish that you would. I mean, I, I, <laughs> we could work out a way to write one together if it helps you yeah, yeah. get one out. Um, but yeah, I am telling you to write a book, but who am I? I mean, Wait. people, to, persons don't exist. <laughs> I would love to write a book. And, you know, I think about that. I'm like, I'm still in the midst of my, disc, you know, yeah, someday. But I, I but now's the time. Saying. Now's the time to get a book deal when you're hot on you know the the recent uh, win. But what, but then if I win a fourth time, they're gonna have to reprint the book as four time. You know, so I. Oh, I but they'll wait love that. 
they'll love that new introduction one again oh yeah legacy publishers are going to love that no that's not a problem that's a solution <laughs> that's exactly what they would do if if josh four competed again and won again it would be a new yeah. edition updated uh uh moonwalking with einstein that's absolutely what they would do and it would crush that's it cool. again it still crushes it that book <laughs> That would be cool to have Josh Four and Nelson and Ron White and and Rem and Alex Mullen, like all the and Lance, all the top of the top people who ever competed. Anyway, yeah, that'd be awesome. It'd be an amazing. Show. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. it's possible, but that's the thing. Like, if you ask the question, you know, do you get the answer that would would prompt it? Because books are hard. There's no two ways about it. Um, and it's always always sort of a risk, um, but yeah, I would love to see a book from you and and a book from from all the people. You know, yeah. it makes me yeah. sad that it isn't there. If I wrote a book, it'd be more in the realm of this type of podcast of because there's tons of memory books out there. Yeah. I think I have some nuances and things to add to memory that aren't shared for sure, but. Uh, but yeah, I have a I have a perspective on my experience, my story of what I've lived through, which is what people want to hear, right? Um, yeah. How I transmitted panic attacks, anxiety, a memory champion, I'm all mixed in there. It's all swirled in there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe someday <laughs> we'll write that. People okay. let me know. If you, if you like this idea, reach out to me and let me know because I'd love to hear that. And if there's anything I can do to help, that would be wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Well, we at least have a transcript out of our conversations uh, for, for now. Mm -hmm. By way of coming to an, uh, a, a sort of wrap up on, on this topic, what do you, do, do you have, an, a, speaking of like images of everything and images of nothing that must be something, <laughs> uh, all that sort of thing, do you have, other than what we've already talked about in terms of competing again or, or so forth, do you have any inkling of where your experiences that you've been having might go what it might evolve into mm. great question i just being completely honest i i believe we're in the midst of something big happening on earth in a very good way um it's hard to say that now because the world seems insanely crazy and chaotic but i also think that's part of a, a shift that's happening right now um I think nothing but good things are happening. And I think from speaking personally from the work that I've done, meaning the work of the internal work that I talk about, healing my mental and emotional health to a place of flow of energy, allowing this energy to flow through me differently and feel more whole has opened me up to spiritual perceptions and abilities that I didn't fathom. And I'm, I'm not the only one. I mean, you talk about them and other people very much are the same thing, but um, I don't know where it's going because it's only, it's rapidly accelerating for me. My life is getting better and better despite anything that might happen today. You know, I'm still a normal person that has normal issues and problems and flat tire type of stuff. Mm. But despite all that, am I feeling enlightened? I don't know. I don't really know what that word means yet, but am I feeling a, a love flowing through me all times? Um, for the most part, yeah. In a presence, yeah. And I think that's wonderful. I think for me, the future is I, I want to help more people because helping other people um, in a podcast like this or in a life is really what changes the world. I don't think you guys are going to change the world. Here, here's a belief I'll throw you out with. <clears throat> I believe fully that the world is just a reflection of everything inside of me. My thoughts, my trapped emotions, my shit, my good stuff, all every belief and every emotion and every trait that I have internally gets blasted out into the world, projected out. It's like kind of like a virtual reality world, kind of, right? Mm. I would love to elaborate on this more, but if you look at, if you at least look at the world that way, as this world is like a game that's helping me, if I learn the lessons, if someone comes and cuts me off 
What's the lesson I, I need to learn in that? What do I need to feel to help me process this stuff out so that I can advance to the next level of enlightenment or the next level of learning of patience, of love, of understanding, of compassion? That's what has served me the best because you can look at this world as a as a victim of like this shit, that, all this, blaming. You can do that, but no one's ever enlightened themselves with blaming or gotten better with that or criticizing or guilt. So if you view the world as like, this reality is helping me. When a baby cries in my ear, it's teaching me patience and to feel all that tension that's welling up in my body to relax, to love this baby as if it were me. Because what if that baby is you? <laughs> and I know I'm throwing some really crazy stuff out there, but what if we are all part of the same source, awareness? What if we're all the same? What if you and I are not separate, but we're part of the same everything, a slice of it? And you're, a slice of it is Anthony, a slice of it is John, and we're experiencing the world and we're bouncing around trying to learn what the heck's going on, but we're all from the same source. So I'll say that, like, this is this work has opened me up profoundly to new concepts and terms and knowings that I can't quite describe fully on this podcast, but many of you know and have opened up to things like this. So look at the world as if it were you, as if you are projecting out the video game of life. How can I up level? And up leveling, going up, the, the highest you can go is unconditional love. So think about the world in that way. What can I love about this? What can I, how can I give love to that? And how can I heal this inside so that my world reflects better? Because as I up level in this game, I feel better and better. More good stuff comes to me. People talk about law of attraction and all this stuff. I'm, but if you change inside, the world changes on the outside and it comes, a lot of stuff comes into you. Mm like magnetically you talk about magnetic memory <laughs> stuff magnetically pops into your world that you're like that's where i'm at the point where like i'm like holy crap this doesn't make any sense why i get this call out of the blue this person i never heard of this thing pops into my life like magic mm. i read a billboard that speaks to me i just asked a question two minutes ago and that billboard has the answer that I look for, it doesn't make any sense. But if you look at the world like that, it does make sense. So anyway, I'm throwing some crazy stuff yeah. out there, but I think heal yourself and the world's gonna open up to you. Well, there, there there's much I agree in that. I, I place the uh, <laughs> cosmic stop sign a, a little bit differently, but I mean, I think that even if I would then say, yeah, but what about all the times I don't get the message? I myself think you're exactly right. The world is something that appears in us. The story of the Big Bang, which has all the evidence that it has, right? Whatever. It's still coming from oneness, right? I mean, at least that's how I understand it. And if, even if it produ produces all this difference, it still leads mm -hmm. back to a original source, at least as I understand it. But then there's also, well, uh, maybe there was nothing before that, nothing being a something. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe that maybe it's pure difference. And that's yeah. that's another uh, thing that we can maybe put a bookmark on and speak about in the in in the future, because part of how memory techniques work is works is not just making associations, but also recognizing the differences between things as potential hooks. And so anyway, there's philosophical things where Nietzsche talks about the eternal return of the same, but another philosopher, Deleuze, says that's all good, except for it's probably the eternal return of difference. And difference is the thing that creates the illusion of sameness. Mm. All heavy stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But at the end of the day, uh, I don't know. And I, I appreciate being able to noodle over these thoughts, not just with you, but with someone who shares our passion with... Yeah. With the, I want to touch on that one thing right before, because yes. this can leave people in a bad spot, is that that exact question of, well, John, why am I not getting the answer? Or even worse, why do I keep getting the same shit, mm. the same depressed feelings, the same anxiety, same panic attacks? Look, I get it because I was hopeless, not hopeless, but helpless at one point, the bottom of the bottom, right? 
Mm. Um, not suicidal, but I was down there in the misery. Like there was no light. But life was giving me exactly what I needed. Because you can't experience a, an extreme polarity without knowing how to get to the other side. You can't have you can't have strength without resistance. And you can't have um <laughs> there's so many examples of this. You can't have ang- anxiety, you know, without knowing the opposite of peace. You can't have peace without anxiety, right? And so everything that's being given to you, ask yourself, what's the lesson and what do I need to learn? Why? Most of the answer is what I shared. You're off with your mind. You're listening to your ego. You've got some trapped, unresolved stuff that's going on. But uh, I think whether good or bad is going in your world, or I'm not getting the answer. Maybe you are getting the answer. Maybe patience is the answer because you're impatient and you're looking for an answer. Or maybe you know the answer, but you don't want to go that route. You know, So I share that because I have to leave that with people who are feeling miserable right now, that what you're going through is actually teaching you what you need to learn. And I say that very humbly. Mm. But I believe if you look at this world like that, with that lens, your life will change. Play it like a video game in a way. Don't go around shooting people or robbing banks or, you know, hijacking cars like Grand Theft Auto, but, you know. And don't literally kill the Buddha. (laughs) Yeah, how do I? Yeah, don't kill the Buddha. <laughs> but yeah, but I I very much appreciated this conversation because I think we, the world needs to hear people's crazy ideas and what they've been through because they're going through it too. Yeah. And they need that. And heaven forbid it would ever be shut down, these kinds of conversations. And we're at great risk of that happening as we speak, which is uh, tremendously disturbing that that we've gotten this way in in this year with all the technology that we've had uh, develop. So I think I would go even a little step further in consoling people who have this issue. Not only are there is your, your body or your mind trying to send you signals, but I think what both of us are saying is that the solution, if it isn't already in yourself, the path to the solution is in yourself. Where else would it be? So we have always this like tendency to put the responsibility outside, but the image of the outside is inside of you. Like where else would it be? So uh, having gone through great situations of distress myself, that was the lesson I needed to work my way towards or have thrust upon me was that if there's going to be a solution, it is not going to be reliant on anything outside because the outside is inside. And that has to be contended with. It has to be worked with. And as you say, can't push away the feeling because you know that's the Freudian idea of the return of the repressed. You push it away, it come not only does it come back, but it comes back with more power. And mm. same thing with disease. You ignore disease, it's it's only going like physical disease. It's only going to get worse if it's untended. So, uh, and even then, you got to find your inner resource to get yourself to the doctor that can help, etc. So. Yeah. uh, I'll say this too. If anyone is interested in reaching out to me about this topic, you know, this is what I do for a living. I help people overcome overwhelm, anxiety, panic attacks, uh, procrastination, entrepreneurs specifically. But you go to my website, optimizeyourmind.co. There's a video there. There's a way to contact me too, to set up a call if you qualify to walk through this stuff. But um, you do have the power and the knowing inside to know how to to know what to do next. That's what Anthony's saying. Don't look for anyone else to save you. Look for your internal guidance. But if that internal guidance is nudging you to get help or assistance, please do so, right? From someone like myself or an expert or someone who can guide you through a process that they've learned. Um, but yeah, these mental, emotional, it shouldn't be called mental health because it's more so emotional mental, emotional, it's more so emotional health when you look at it, but you, anyone listening to this, we all do the same thing. We all store it the same way, handle it the same way. Just know that it can be released. It can be wherever your deepest, darkest moment is. If you believe and you have the willpower to do something about it, it can be completely released in the right way Um, without medication, without the talk therapy for 10 years and all that stuff. Um, so I'll leave yeah. it at that. Yeah. 
you kind of got to just get rid of the tyranny of categories. Categories are useful, but whenever you're thinking me, you, us, them, it, them, he, she, it, it the past, future, th this is this is the obstacle that sort of needs to be overcome in a lot in a lot of these things. Um, so, thank you for your experience, uh, your inspiration with all the things that you're doing, and yeah, we should get together whether you go uh, into another competition or not to to continue where we left our our bookmark there. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we could talk about all, all kinds of things too. Uh, Let's so go I, further next time and talk more examples, and I'm sure it'll open up quite dramatically. Yes, um, it will. <laughs> I will be back with you. I enjoy this. Perfect. Well, I look forward thank to you it. For having me. Thank you so much. I want to thank John again for joining us to talk about these topics, especially during the tone and tenor of our times. I know it can seem like, you know, first world problems that we're <laughs> addressing and so forth. But the reality is, is that our experiences still is real, even if there are things going on historically that have much more, shall we say, dire consequences if they aren't attended to. So who knows how to balance all of this out? But I'm glad that we can have the conversation and I'm glad that we can have it in a way that we don't necessarily agree on every little bit, but we can be very civil about it and respectful and just acknowledge the fact that nobody can know what's going on in the brain of another person, even if certain Bayesian statistics let you basically know what can be going on <laughs> in other people's brains, at least so it seems. In any case, let us know what you think in the comments. And if you've had similar experiences, we'd love to hear from you. And of course, if you're going to compete in the next USA Memory Championship, buckle down. You've got some stellar competition waiting for you.